Thank you. The help of exogenous okay. forces Hi, everyone. like wind, air, ice, morning. into tiny little soil debris. Right. And Webinar. these debris, they move from one place to another, again with the help of the same okay. exogenous forces. Now these small fragments get deposited in the form of layers and layers one after another. This process creates pressure that is called well, compaction. And as it is, there is a good uh, amount Emily, of heat under the a, crust. Uh, so it becomes all the more easier for these debris to develop into a full-fledged rock. This process is called yeah, lithification. Go, go back to the, in many uh, sedimentary. Back to the YouTube. You have in this second. video, we're going to read about the rock cycle. Okay, good. Turn it off. Now. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, no, you guys all can see the secrets. Okay. <laughs> we had a sneak peek. Um, okay, so we'll get started. Um, today we're going to go over a little bit about the drilling procedure, the survey and drilling procedures, and really everything that has to do with a borehole from start to finish. Um, today I am, I'm Emily Torgeman, and I am here presenting with Gil Guberman. He's the new hydrogeologist. I know that a lot of you haven't met him yet in person, but we're really excited to um, start this year and come and visit everyone and hopefully improve our standards and improve all of our procedures. So this will be the beginning of all of that. Um, this is us in our beautiful pictures in the office uh, holding water containers. Um, I am from Texas and Gil is from Israel and so we will be supporting you this year um, going through all of the drilling and boreholes. So we wanted to go through all of the hydrogeologists in Innovation Africa. In Uganda we have Jonin, he joined us um, recently. Um, then in Zambia, we have John Kaluba. In Tanzania, we have Timwani Chisunka. And in Cameroon, we have Pascal Manwe. Um, in South Africa, we have Judith Muchekwa. Um, and also Nakwandu Nedlovo and uh, Renai Mavina. So those are all of our hydrogeologists in South Africa. And in Tanzania, our newest hydrogeologist is Richard Dixon. And we're so happy to have all of you guys and happy to have everyone um, there to supervise and make sure that we have the best boreholes possible. Um, so here, I wanted to talk a little bit about what hydrogeology really is. There's kind of two parts of hydrogeology. One is the water side and the other is the rock side. So Hydrogeology is the area of geology that deals with the distribution and movement of groundwater in the soil and rocks of the Earth's crust, commonly known as aquifers. So when we refer to aquifers, we're talking about areas in the rocks beneath our feet that hold water. Here on this side, we have two, two different versions. One is a fractured rock aquifer, and the other one is a sedimentary aquifer. And so we'll go a little bit more into that, but these are two different ways that water can sit in the land beneath our feet. So we want to switch over to a quick video that helps us get a little bit more information about what types of rocks we have and where water sits in those rocks. So, what would you say? Here we go. Give me a second. Oh, it's playing. Yeah. This stuff is. Try to go full screen. Yeah, we'll do that if we can. Hold on. Oh, I got it. Pause it. Okay, so here we're going to go through the rock cycle. About the rock cycle. Now, this is the picture of a rock cycle. So no rock remains the same. With time, pressure, and other natural forces, they transform. Remember we called igneous rocks as primary rocks? And the reason is because they are directly formed from the magma and lava when these molten material solidifies. So anything that is formed from the basic most ingredient of earth has to be termed as primary rocks. Now that we know igneous rocks are called primary rocks, Ultimately, the other rocks, that is the sedimentary and metamorphic rocks, are called as secondary because they are formed from igneous rocks. Let me explain how. You see, igneous rocks are the reason sedimentary and metamorphic rock exist. Let's see it as a story. 
Imagine the magma coming out of the mantle through volcanic eruption. Now this magma cools down and becomes solid crystal. And that is how igneous rocks are formed. Now as time passes, various weathering agents or we can also call them exogenous forces like wind, rain, glacier activities acts on this igneous rocks and they slowly turn into or rather I would say break rocks into these small fragments or debris which we call as sediments. And then these small fragments or debris are buried under layers and layers with time and pressure they cement together into sedimentary rocks and this process is called lithification. I have a video on sedimentary rocks, the link is in the description. In that I have explained how a sedimentary rock breaks into smaller chunks or debris and when you see those debris you can easily relate what I am talking about. So that was the formation of sedimentary rocks from igneous rocks. Now this sedimentary rock has the tendency to break apart again into smaller debris or sediments. Now comes the part where we need to find out how metamorphic rocks are formed. Do you remember that caterpillar changes into butterfly? We call that process as metamorphosis. So this metamorphosis occurs in rocks as well, especially when they are heated to 300 to 700 degrees Celsius. Now where does the heat come from? Now inside the earth there is tremendous amount of heat due to pressure. Push your hands together very hard and you can feel the heat. Rub them and due to friction you will have heat. Similarly, when earth's tectonic plate move around it produces heat. When the plates converges, meaning comes closer, they build mountains. Now that is also a tremendous amount of pressure and heat. Now that we know how the heat comes from, what does this heat do to the rocks? It bakes them. Just like how you bake a cookie from dough, it does not melt the dough, right? It changes its form. Similarly, rocks do not melt. It transforms into metamorphic rocks. That's why you'll find metamorphic rocks mostly in mountain areas. And again, with exogenous forces like wind, water, these metamorphic rocks can be broken and washed away into sediments. And these sediments can again make sedimentary rocks. The rock cycle never stops. Metamorphic and igneous rocks find their way into the mantle through subduction. It happens when two plate converges and then one plate goes under another. This way all these metamorphic and igneous rocks find their way into the mantle. And we know mantle consists of molten rocks called magma and again magma comes out on the surface through volcanic activity and that's how you find the sources of igneous rocks. So this is the rock cycle. I hope you understood with this illustration. If you want to see more of such educational content, make sure you're subscribed. Okay, so this was a little bit about the, the rock cycle itself, and it gives us an idea of what different types of rocks that we are working with in our um, boreholes. So generally, in most of the boreholes that we are drilling in Innovation Africa, many of the, the boreholes will be in these hard crystalline rocks that don't have a lot of room to hold water. And the only place that we hold water is cracks and fractures. In Cameroon, However, in some places in South Africa, we have sedimentary aquifers, which hold a lot more water and a lot more predictable in order to find a good amount of water. So we're always trying to figure out where we can find the water in the cracks and fractures and, um, and how we move forward to have as much water as possible with the best borehole as possible. Um, here is a nice little picture that kind of shows us the whole cycle of um, hydrogeology. Uh, it gives a description of what an aquifer is, which is a porous body of rock or sediment that is saturated with groundwater. And groundwater enters the aquifer here when it rains. So what we need to know about this is that the rainfall that comes is what we call recharge. It's how the water gets back into the aquifer. And here we see that there are two different types of aquifers. One is in this fractured um, mountainous rock here. And the other aquifer here is in the sand and gravel sedimentary aquifer. And we can see that there are other ways that water can get in. First of all, you can have water coming in through rivers. Um, but what's important is when we do drill our boreholes, it's important to remember that the water isn't coming directly from above the borehole. It could be coming from a very long way away. So all the time we need to figure out kind of where the water is coming from and how much of it we really have. So here we have 
three different examples. It just gives you a little bit more of an idea of where the water is sitting in these aquifers. In igneous and metamorphic aquifers, we have the fractures in these rocks you can see here. And then in sedimentary aquifers that are in sandstone or limestone, there's a lot more space for water to sit. So in sedimentary aquifers, you have sand and in between those sand grains, there's a lot of um, area for, it's called pore space and there's a lot of place for water to sit. And then also in limestone aquifers, which is what we have in Israel, there, the rock is sort of soft and as water flows through it, it creates caverns and really big spaces for water to, to sit. And that's opposed to the igneous and metamorphic aquifers where we just have these net fracture networks that we have to find every time we drill a borehole. So the main boreholes that we drill, like I said, again, um, this is uh, an most of our aquifers, we deal with one main system where you can see this is the, the general rock column that we drill through in most of our, our boreholes. The first layer we see here is called laterite. It's kind of a, it's just a, a fancy name for the soil that sits on the top. So when we drill, we drill down through some softer soil, maybe some clays, um, and really it's like the very broken down um, weather pieces that is essentially becomes a sedimentary rock that we talked about before. The next layer that we get into is called the saprolite. And the saprolite is usually, it's one of the two areas where water can sit in these igneous um, aquifers. And it's the, the weathered zone that's kind of at the transition space between the, the fresh crystalline, really hard, really fresh rock, the igneous rock that we talked about before. And that is the area where we have the old rock sitting there and as time goes on and water comes through, the, the rock starts to break down. And so the space between those grains breaks down and creates pore space. And that's the saprolite. And then below that, we have a fracture zone, which you can see here. Um, and the fracture zone is basically the beginning of the next saprolite area. When you have fractures that come down, the, the fractures will then create areas where more water can come through, they'll become weathered, and then we'll have more space. After that, we have the hard basement rock. And once we get down into the basement rock, there's very little chance that we will find water. So what we really wanna do is find one of these two few situations. These are examples of, of how boreholes can look. And it's also kind of an explanation of when we have dry boreholes in, um, in Innovation Africa, it's very upsetting and usually, what happens is we get to a dry borehole that we don't find any fractures and we go right down into the, the crystalline basement rock and there's just no space for water to sit. Again, we can have a low yielding borehole when we have a very small saprolite area or we just enter into a few fractures and we don't have enough water. There's not enough water sitting there. Now, what we're really looking for are these productive boreholes that go through a large saprolite zone or they, like in this area, we go through a, a very large saprolite zone and even into some of the fractures. And in this borehole, we have a smaller saprolite zone, but a very big fracture network. So both of these situations are things that we're looking for um, in order to allow us to find places that will have more water. Now, we don't have a guarantee about how much water there will be, but these, this is the goal. This is what we're really looking for to find the most amount of water. Pass it over to you. Can you switch? Yep. Let's pin up. Sorry. All right. Uh, this is not the right slide. Okay. Hear me okay? Good. Great. So, first of all, um, I don't see you guys, but <laughs> I did before. It's uh, nice to meet all of you and really looking forward to meeting you uh, in country as soon as possible. So just to continue, um, here we see the initial steps within, let's call them sub-steps within uh, the first stage from the stages that Sivan presented earlier. And these are basically the uh, steps that the Innovation Africa supervisor, usually the hydrogeologist, it could be maybe a water engineer or someone else. Um, these are the steps that they need to uh, supervise and assist in, okay? So we will go one by one now. Starting with the hydrogeological survey. So 
the survey is basically composed of the hydrogeological part, um, part and the geophysical part. The reports are actually created by the contractors, but as an IA supervisor, it is very important that we review these reports as thoroughly as possible. And we expect the report to include um, the hydrogeological report or survey should include two parts, a desk study and a field study. The desk study, as we see here, is basically a compilation of all kinds of resources. It can be water resources where we figure out where the rivers and lakes are, topographic maps, satellite images, geological maps, of course, are very important, but we don't know. It depends on the resolution, right? So we don't know how um, fine uh, resolution they, they actually have. And of course, it's very important that we know um, about any other existing boreholes in the area, because most likely when those were drilled, they also had records um, of the geology and so forth. So the desk study is really a crucial part of the survey. And again, it is up to us not to compile these reports, but at least to review them and to make sure that they make sense and that they include enough information as much as possible. The next part of the hydrogeological survey is the field study. Now the field study is very important because in the field study, um, we can see things that we might not necessarily see from satellite images, right? So for example, points of contamination. This is very important that we uh, identify and we map these different points. It can be, well, in the next slide, I'll go through the different points of uh, different examples of, uh, of these points, but basically it's anywhere where uh, that the substances or anything can enter the aquifer or the borehole. And we wanna make sure that uh, we're aware of these threats. Okay, so these are, um, maybe you've seen this, I know that for sure our, our teams have seen this in some of our trainings. Uh, these are examples of borehole threats and kind of um, general minimum distances uh, for drilling our boreholes from these threats. So for example, buildings, you know, we see we have many buildings, we cannot be too strict with that, but again, we want to leave, prefer to leave at least 10 meters from any buildings, roads, about the same 20 meters. Um, of course, once we get to things like um, latrines and septic tanks, we wanna leave at least 30 meters, preferably even 50 meters. Um, then we have natural things like streams um, and rivers. Uh, these we want between 50 to 100 meters distance. Okay, so again, these are the distances that the borehole that we drill should be from any existing uh, structures. Of course, um, livestock, uh, grave sites, uh, we want to go even further, 300 meters, and um, trash dumps and waste disposal sites, of course, we want to stay far away from those, 500 meters. We didn't actually write mines because there's no specific distance, but of course, we have to map, we have to be aware of any mines in the area, and we need to make sure that we're not drilling too close to those mines. Um, also, uh, existing production wells or boreholes, it is important that we leave at least 500 meters from those because those, if they were not constructed um, by us, we don't actually know if they were constructed properly and those could be very easy access for any contaminants to enter the aquifer. So, as I said, um, we have, we had the uh, hydrogeological survey and then we continue to the geophysical survey. So um, geophysical surveys are used to identify any location where we might find fracture or weathered zones or such as a saprolite um, underground, okay? Now, it is important that, again, as an IA supervisor, we are not the ones performing the geophysical survey, but we have to supervise it. We have to make sure that it's being done correctly. What does that mean? It means, first of all, that at least six points are being surveyed for a specific site, okay? For a specific village or project, we expect the geophysical surveyor to find at least six different points. Now, how does he even come up, he or she come up with um, where to, to perform the geophysical survey based on the hydrogeological survey, okay? In the hydrogeological survey, 
let's say we reviewed the geological maps and we see the areas where it's more likely to have fractured zones and therefore the geophysical surveyor will go there. So six points need to be surveyed. From those six points, we expect in the report for there to be at least three recommended drilling sites, okay? We need to identify those and we need to make sure that um, the recommendations make sense. When we're out in the field and we're um, supervising the survey, we wanna make sure that the equipment is set up correctly. Now we are not geophysicists. We know that you are not geophysicists, but we should have an indication of if the equipment is being set up correctly, um, at least by taking, uh, by documenting it, okay? So if, make sure to take photos, make sure to note down which methods are being used. Um, and all of this will go into the uh, IA app, into the new forms that later on this week, we will uh, go through with you. So there are different types of techniques, geophysical techniques for groundwater exploration such as um, some of them are not actually written here, such as seismic or using gravity, but the two um, techniques that we use most often uh, in IA projects are electrical resistivity and electromagnetic, okay? Now, electrical resistivity, it basically gives us an indication of fluids and fractures below the surface. And the electromagnetic um, gives us, uh, shows us, magnetic anomalies, okay? So most usually these are different geological formations um, that basically uh, it could be magma intrusion, intrusions, for example, that uh, lead to preferred pathways and can hold and store water underground, okay? So this is what we're detecting in these, um, in these measurements. Now, these measurements are great for groundwater, um, but the, the deeper the in area of investigation is, so when we have aquifers that are more than 100 meters, the resolution and the reliability of the results will decrease, okay? So this is something that we need to take into consideration that the deeper the water is, the less accurate uh, the results from the geophysical survey are. And that's just uh, um, something we have to, we have to deal with. Um, so again, it's very important that as an IA supervisor, you are familiar at a basic level with the, these two different types of techniques um, and that you're able to at least uh, make a basic interpretation of uh, the results from the surveys. Okay, so once we finish the hydrogeological and the geophysical survey um, and we've reviewed the report, uh, we can basically commence with drilling, right? So from the geophysical survey, we will start with the most recommended uh, point for drilling a borehole. And again, these are the responsibilities um, of the IA hydrogeologist in the field. So before drilling, we've reviewed and you've approved the desk study in the survey, okay? Then when you're in the field, you should make sure that the borehole that is being drilled matches the same GPS coordinates as the point from the geophysical survey. Now, of course, it won't always be exactly on the meter because maybe that site is not completely accessible at the time, but it should be as close as possible, all right? If you have any concern that maybe it is too far from the GPS coordinate of the, from the geophysical survey, then of course, uh, you can always consult with us here at headquarters. Then um, before the drilling, you need to make sure that the driller has uh, a rig that is suitable for this borehole. So if they recommended to drill to 150 meters, you need to make sure that the um, driller is bringing a rig that can drill to that depth and to the required diameter. And this depth that is recommended from the geophysical survey, it's also important to uh, emphasize and to remind the driller that there is a, a plus minus 15% here, okay? So why would you want to, um, why would we, when would we drill 15% uh, more? For example, if at the very bottom of the borehole, let's say they reached 150, that was the recommended depth, but at 150, we're at a water strike. So of course we want to continue drilling uh, until we finish that water strike in order to take advantage of the aquifer as best as possible. Okay, so this is the minus plus 15% buffer. 
minus 15, maybe we already drilled, we have a very high yield, and there's no need to continue drilling, okay? Lastly, before the drilling begins, we wanna make sure that the driller has all the necessary materials, okay? That he has enough casing, um, permanent and temporary, gravel pack, bentonite, all of it, okay? Um, then we start with the actual drilling. So during the drilling, um, the responsibility of, of the hydrogeologist is first of all, it's some of the things that are written here are, are not being performed by you, okay, as the supervisor. It's being performed by the contractor, but it is on you to supervise. And what does that mean? To supervise, it means to make sure that it's happening, that it's taking place, and to confirm that it's being done correctly um, and that it's being recorded properly, okay? So for example, the lithological logging, this is um, this, the point while we drill, we take um, samples of the, the soil or the rock and uh, sort them, okay, into little boxes. This is the lithological logging. It basically gives us a, um, kind of a, a record of the geology as we drill. And again, this is up to the driller, but it is important that you supervise it. The driller's yield. The driller's yield um, should be at least one uh, liter per second in order to proceed to the next stage. It could be that the driller it's in his interest um, to move to the next stage and he will give a certain yield, all right? He will give his driller's yield. It is important that you uh, confirm this number, okay? Um, and, and that we don't trust uh, the driller blindly, okay? It's, it's very important that um, we get the right yields. Uh, additionally, penetration rate logging, this is still up to the driller, but it, uh, we should be able to, to uh, confirm that he is doing it. And um, again, we make sure that the borehole is reached the agreed depth uh, plus minus 15%. Electrical conductivity, maybe the contractor has an EC meter. Um, and if not, then we can do it ourselves or we can do it together with them. The electrical conductivity is basically telling us um, the amount of dissolved uh, ions in the water. So usually it's an indication of salinity, okay? Um, one thing to take into to, to note, when we measure the EC during the drilling, the number is usually higher than the actual EC of the water. Why? Because when the drill goes down, it crushes the rock and the rock has minerals in it uh, or can have minerals in it that will increase temporarily the EC of the water. But usually within, if we let the, the borehole rest for a day or longer, the EC will go down. So we do measure it during the drilling, but it is important to of course measure it afterwards again. Lastly, the standing water level. This is something that um, we will measure at the end of the drilling and not immediately because immediately after the drilling, the water is disturbed, okay? The water column in the aquifer is disturbed um, it has extra materials in it. It's, it's been disturbed by the pressure that's uh, the air pressure blown from the drill rig. So we, we want to measure the standing water level, get an accurate measurement the next day. All right. Okay. And now we're going to watch uh, one more video. This is two of two. Sorry. The survey and we'll... today we are going to, to discuss about drilling procedure and now as we have a site here we have already surveyed and we located a good point for drilling so when we reach here with drilling machines we make sure that at the, our site we have a vinoch, a vinoch uh, for measuring the water which will be uh, flowing out during drilling also, we have a, a, sample, a sampling box, which will be taking the samples each stage of drilling. For our case, we take uh, samples after two meters deep. We collect that sample and we put in a box for more analysis. So, after making sure that uh, these important things are there, you start drilling. So, for starting drillings, 
first of all we use uh, we call it a clay cutter you use clay cutter so you, you, this clay cutter is to identify or to drill up to where you can find a hard rock because uh, before installing the be drilling bit or hammer the drilling hammer cannot drill well to this uh, soft soil so we use the soil uh, clay cutter to make a, a hole which it have got uh, uh, 10, 10 inches, 10 inches. So after using this clay cutter, then you install a temporary casing according to where you have got that uh, hard strata. So after installing this um, temporary casing, normally it is metal, it's not a PVC or plastic. So after installing this one, then you connect it or you put a drilling hammer of six inches. So why we start with six, six inches? First of all, we say that uh, we start with a small inches to drill up to where you get water. So after coming to the point that, okay, this uh, level of depth is, is uh, with water which you have mentioned is enough, then you change, you start to limit. Then you replace this six inches uh, bit or hammer to the eight inches to get a, a big a borehole and then you limb up to that levels and then after limbing in collaboration with the water measuring or log you sit down you sit down here where you strike water where you find water and then where you end and where you find it was no water then you design so you design for putting casing there's a screen casing which allow water to where you strike the aquifers to make sure that the water from the ground will go straight to the borehole. So you plan or you design how to put that screen. And also you design where to put a plain screen. Uh, at the bottom we start with a plain scheme, maybe two or three, depending to how you found the, your borehole, how the nature of the borehole, and how you see during drilling the silting. So uh, this, is, this is starting plain uh, at the start of the borehole. Normally we, we call it a dead storage because normally it accommodates the settlement of these silties during drilling go down to the to this plane at the start. Then after connecting that one, then you connect it with this screen up to the level where you start st uh, striking the aquif water aquifers. Also, you come out, you design the how to plug because during drilling you find that there is an open aquifer. This open aquifer, you design it to, to stop with bentonite to make sure that the water which will be coming from open aquifer will not penetrate in the borehole and sometimes com contaminate your good water which you found at the deep. So you seal by using the material known as bentonite. After installation of bentonite, yeah, you proceed with gravel parking. You left it 20 meters before reaching to the ground level and then you install we call it a sanitary seal this sanitary seal we, we will backfill with the normal soils or clay soil or lead soil which are uh, we, we think is not uh, permeable so also you left six meters from ground level you seal with a, a cement you mix a cement you see that wow this is to hinder or to limit the land of uh, to go inside or to go around the boho or to go around the casing so it stops runoff, runoff to go around the boho, the casing such that it can go more deep and contaminate our boho. Then we come to the boho development. Cleaning the boho after completion of insulation of casing uh, after insulation of bentonite and this is cement seas. You flush by inserting air in the boho. This airflow takes water outside in the high pressure. It cleans those impurities or small particles to allow to facilitate good recharge of water in the borehole. So after completion of development or flushing, let's say uh, one hour to two hours, you flush the borehole. Then you leave the borehole to settle two to three days to make sure that the, uh, the aquifer return to its normal recharge because during uh, during drilling and the flushing you you produce or you insert a lot of airs which disturb the aquifer stability 
So once you leave uh, two days, it means that this air relieve, relieve from the aquifers and take the aquifers to its normal. And after that three days, you can come to conduct a pump test. And that pump test, you will find a good recharge of the borehole because you leave the borehole to settle to its normal recharge or to normal flows. So the result of the borehole pump test, it become good to your uh, future or next step designing. So now, let me take you to see what those steps which I have explained to that area of drilling. Okay, welcome. All right, so we can thank Leonard for that uh, great demonstration, a very educational video. I hope that it clarified some of the things that we talked about so far. And so now we move from the drilling to, well, we actually were still in the drilling and this is just a recap of what we need to be logging or what we need to supervise um, during the drilling. So we said the lithological logging, the driller's yield, the rate of penetration, the electrical conductivity, at the water strikes and the static water level at the end of the drilling, okay? Uh, we can also see some of the um, instruments that are used for this. So here in number one, we can see lithological logging. This is without uh, the carton boxes, but basically these are samples from uh, the borehole while drilling. Uh, and as you see, it's in powder form because obviously the rock has been crushed. The driller's yield uh, here in number two, this is using a V-notch and basically it's a method for trying to, for quantifying the discharge of the water. Number three here, we can see a, a sort of an illustration of uh, the penetration rate. So we see the hammer of the drill um, being lowered or being uh, pushed uh, against the rock. Number four, the electrical conductivity. This is a very simple EC meter that uh, our teams have and it, we can use it to measure the uh, electrical conductivity. We basically take a water sample from a certain depth, uh, let's say at a water strike, and then we can measure the conductivity. Uh, and lastly, number five here, this is a water level meter. We're, we've actually ordered water level meters for all our teams and they will hopefully be arriving soon. Um, so you'll be able to use them, but basically uh, using a water level meter, the probe that you see here on the end um, it beeps one, when it uh, touches water. So you would lower it into the borehole and it has a measuring tape. And uh, once it beeps, you know you've hit the water table and you can see how far down, what the depth is. Okay, so now we move on to the borehole installation, what materials we need, what do we need to check? So first of all, the casing, very, very important. Um, it is your responsibility as the IA supervisor to make sure that all of the equipment um, meets the standards, okay? Uh, obviously it's the driller, the contractor who's bringing the, who's providing this equipment, but we need to make sure, or you need, you're our eyes and ears um, in the field and it's um, important that they bring the right equipment, right? So uh, first of all, the casing, it should be class 10 or above. Uh, the casing should have uh, threaded joints. You can see an example here on the plane casing, the threaded joints is how you attach the casing um, pieces. One, usually they come in, in uh, lengths of three meters or six meters, and then you basically attach them. You screw them onto each other. The minimum diameter, um, what we require is uh, 150 millimeters or six inches. That's the diameter okay, of the casing and the actual thickness of the material. If it's PVC, we need seven millimeters or more. Um, and if it's steel, it can be four millimeters. In terms of the width of the slots. So here again, if you look at the image uh, on the bottom left, we see plain casing and slotted casing. So the slotted casing, you, you see the slots here. When we say a width of one to two millimeters, um, it's basically how wide the, the, the slot is in the plastic, in the PVC. And the slotted casing is, is installed, we'll get more into exactly where we install it, but uh, basically the idea is that um, in the slotted casing, water can enter inside um, the pipe, inside the casing, right, through these slots. Um, so we, we need to find the right balance for the water to be able to enter um, 
efficiently, right? So we have a, a high enough yield and we get enough water, but without letting large particles also enter the casing. Um, and it is also very important that the casing is factory manufactured, okay? And not something that's just been improvised. Um, so again, uh, factory manufactured has all the right um, requirements for the diameter and thickness and slot width, and it needs to have the threaded joints. Gravel pack. Gravel pack is something that we insert in the annulus of the borehole, so not within the casing. Basically, it's between the borehole walls and the casing. Um, and it is important that the gravel pack is also a gravel pack that is uh, bought and not just collected from a nearby river. Uh, and that the gravel pack is well sorted and graded. This is uh, makes it more efficient. Uh, and the size of the particles uh, should be two to two and a half millimeters or four to seven millimeters. Uh, depends of course uh, on the, um, well, on the slots, yeah, mainly on the slot size. So on the casing also, um, if it's steel or plastic or PVC. The bentonite plug and the cement sanitary seal. These are two uh, things, uh, two, basically the, the, the purpose of these two is to prevent surface contamination or any kind of contamination, um, both into the borehole and into the aquifer in general, okay? So the bentonite plug, um, bentonite is a type of clay. It's a type of clay material that when, when it gets wet, it um, expands. Okay, so this bentonite plug, uh, we're gonna look at a borehole design uh, after this slide, Emily will show you, but the bentonite plug should um, be from either pellet or powder form. We are trying to move to pellet form because it's just, it's, it's easier um, to install the plug with the pellets and it should be installed below the overburden, okay, uh, at at least 20 meters deep. And it should have a thickness of one to two meters. Okay, it's it, it's not always easy to calculate exactly, but one to two meters thick is what we require. So here in the images, you can see this is a, a bentonite in powder form, and this is bentonite in pellets form. The cement sanitary seal, we can see cement here um, in this image. It's basically the top six meters of the borehole. Okay, will be um, will have this cement sanitary seal, and. At the bottom of the casing, we also require a PVC cap. And again, it is important that it be a manufactured PVC cap, not something that's just improvised, uh, like melted or welded uh, to the casing, uh, because the manufactured PVC cap, it basically, it uh, prevents any particles or any sediments from the borehole going into the casing uh, and into the water. And it also, uh, it helps capture the sediment at the bottom of the borehole. So we always leave um, the cap and some plain casing at the bottom, it's called the sump, for uh, capturing the sediment uh, and making sure that it doesn't um, go through the water and through the rest of the borehole. Okay, so now Emily will continue uh, explaining a typical borehole design. Okay, so here is um, an example of the borehole design that we usually look at. When we talk about civil engineering, we always have these blueprints. We have the plan, the design. So this is how um, hydrogeologists basically look at what a borehole, um, what a borehole looks like, and and what are the characteristics. So, uh, firstly, just as uh, Gil talked about with all these different designs. When I look at a, a borehole design and when I plan a borehole design after drilling, I always go from the bottom up. So I'm talking about this is the total drill depth, which is at 73, and then we have a bottom cap. Um, after the bottom cap, we want to make sure that we have at least one meter for that sump, the for the sediment to collect. So this is important not only because it's a place for sediment to collect, but it's also more to think about the fact that um, when we use slotted casing. We don't want to end up blocking off our slotted casing with sediment, with uh, with dirt that gets inside. So after that, we have the we have plain casing and then slotted casing. So we use slotted casing um, at all of the water strikes. So we drill the borehole, we figure out where the water strikes are, um, and then we create this this plan. 
and we talk about where we want to put the slotted casing in the plain casing. So when I see that there's a water strike, I want to make sure that I'm putting at least six meters of slotted casing at every water strike because when we're drilling, it can be kind of hard to catch that water strike exactly. And it can sometimes be a network of fractures that can be providing water into the borehole. So I wanna give myself a little bit of um, a, uh, we talked about this before, uh, I wanna give myself a, a range that makes sure that I'm capturing all of the water um, inside the borehole. The next thing is we have another water strike here from 34 to 38. And again, I've made sure that there is slotted casing through the whole area and a bit above and a bit below. Um, so after that, we've installed all of our casing. We have casing, um, we also make sure that there's plain casing where the, the spentonite is. And we made sure that we have some more plain casing above the, the final slotted casing. So we want to be putting in slotted casing where there are water strikes and plain casing where there are no water strikes. The other thing that we have to think about as well is the fact that the pump can only be installed in areas that there's plain casing. It cannot be installed in areas that there is slotted casing because we want to make sure that we're not pulling in too much dirt from the sides. So the slotted casing um, allows for water to enter, but we don't want to be pumping um, any sort of spine sediments in from the, the slotted casing. After we've installed the entire casing, we then add the gravel pack on the sides. And this helps to centralize the, the casing in the borehole because we don't want the casing to be um, a little bit off to the side or hit the sides of the borehole at all. So we install the casing straight down. And then as we're doing the installation, we're, we're pouring um, gravel pack around into the sides. And we calculate how much gravel pack we need based on the volume of the outside of this casing. So it kind of gives us an idea of how much gravel pack we're gonna need. And we install the, the gravel pack around. This gravel pack helps, like I said before, to centralize the casing itself. And it also helps filter out any of the sediment from the sides of the borehole. Um, here, I just wanted to go back and say uh, that the casing itself, Gil said before, has to be at least six inches. Now this dotted line here, indicates where the borehole was drilled. So we aren't necessarily drilling a borehole and then putting a casing that's exactly that size in. We need some space on the sides, like we said before, to add the filter pack. Um, and we need to give ourselves room to do the work. So um, what we do is we have the drilling minimum to be eight to 10 inches. And that gives us an opportunity to drill a bigger borehole and have plenty of space to install the casing without any problems. And it also gives us a big enough area to install that filter pack. The next thing that we install is this bentonite seal. Um, like Gil said before, it's one to two meters thickness and we wanna make sure it's below the overburden water and at 20 meters deep. So this kind of, um, like we said before, these two things are what protects from contamination. The cement seal protects from contamination right here on the top at the surface. When we have the bentonite seal, what it really protects from is the overburdened water, the water that's at the very first level that you get to when you're drilling a borehole, and that's called surface water. It's not necessarily at the surface, but it's directly from the surface, and it's the water that can most easily bring contamination down into the borehole from the surface. And it might be from um, cracks or fractures that are farther away, so you don't know if it's contaminated or not, but that's really what the bentonite seal does here. It protects the, the slotted casing from any contamination that could happen between zero and 20 meters um, deeper down. Uh, I think that's about it for here. And then again, we said before that the cement grout seal is from ground level to six meters. Important to notice. Um, and then another thing that I wanted to mention as well is that this bottom cap here needs to be manufactured and not melted because when we um, melt the, sometimes they melt the casing and they cut it, melt it and then squish it together at the bottom. And those can really affect the, the strength of the PVC casing itself and it can break. So we wanna make sure that this bottom caps are manufactured and they are so meant they to go on the bottom of the casing. Okay. So the next step after we do all of this installation 
is we do the um, borehole development. So after we've installed all the casing, the borehole development basically is when we take very high pressure air and we put it down into the borehole, to the bottom of the borehole, and we start to pump really high pressure air out. And you can see here that it looks like um, he has a lot of water coming out. And so we said shower time. Um, it also makes for the best pictures in our projects. Uh, but what this really does is it kind of cleans out the borehole itself after we've installed. So any sediment that got into the casing um, and also any, any sort of uh, little grains of sand or dirt that are in the um, that are in the filter pack itself can also be blasted out this time. So we want to make sure the main idea of the development is to clean everything out. And the way we know it's cleaned out is when you're a supervisor on site, you can see here, you can see that the water is still pretty dark, that it has a lot of dirt inside of it. The goal during development is to make sure that the water runs clear. Now, this is really important because a lot of times um, drillers who are in a rush will say that they'll develop for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and say that the water will clear during the pumping test. But we don't necessarily know that. This is also a good time to catch mistakes that have been made in, in the installation. Sometimes if the casing has been cracked um, during installation or it wasn't installed correctly, we can end up having a lot of sediment coming into the borehole and it can end up ruining our borehole. So one of the markers we have of that is that the water doesn't clear up during development or during the pumping test. So it's important before we go on to the next step that we do the borehole development until the water is clear. And at the end of this borehole development process, we um, want to check out what the driller's yield is. Again, we need to take a little bit of time before we do this. Maybe the next morning is the best time. You wanna give the, the borehole a chance to, um, to recalibrate uh, a bit. And then you wanna take the driller's yield or the blow yield again but this time you'll be taking it with a bucket. It kind of gives us a better idea of what the, the yield of the borehole will be, specifically because we've already done all of that cleaning out. So we clean out the casing, then we do the driller's yield one more time. Um, and so we can use that driller's yield and see if it's higher or lower than what it was during drilling. And then from there, we move into the next stage of drilling. So the next stage we have is the pumping test. The pumping test is something that is so important to every borehole. And it's kind of like the unsung hero of boreholes. Um, when we talk about having pumping tests, it's the only diagnostic tool that can help us understand how much and for how long we can pump this borehole. How much water can we provide to these villages? Um, and we have two different parts of this uh, step test itself. One, the first part is the step test. And the step test gives us an idea of um, how much water. So the duration of this test is four hours. And um, we uh, do four one hour step tests and we have the rate increasing at each step to measure the capability of the aquifer to produce water. So we wanna go from the minimum amount of water, we wanna start on um, a low yield. So we choose a low yield and we say, okay, we know that the borehole can produce this amount of water. We're gonna use that as step one. Then we're gonna go to step two, step three, and step four. The goal is to make sure that we have the minimum amount. And then also at step four, we wanna make sure that we're, the water level in the borehole is going all the way down and that we have fully taken advantage of all the water that's in the borehole. Once we have those two extremes, we know a lot more about how much water can be produced. And from there, we decide we move on to the constant rate test and we can decide what the constant rate should be. Um, the constant rate is prolonged pumping and we use that to evaluate how long we can pump at a specific yield and what's the sustainable yield of the borehole. The last uh, step that we have isn't really a test, but we're measuring how long it takes for the water level, the initial water level that we had, the standing water level that we recovered, how long it takes, we pump and pump and pump and pump and pump, how long it takes for the recovery to come back. And that gives us a good idea about how wide, how big of an area we have as an aquifer. So here we're gonna go into this again. So this is a step test. It's important to remember that um, 
this is, sorry, this is a graph here of what a step test looks, looks like. And the step test has to be carried out at least 24 hours after drilling. Again, we've done something really big by drilling a borehole and we have to give the aquifer time to settle before we really can do some diagnostic work. Um, we need to make sure to give information from the driller's yield. As a supervisor, you give information from the driller's yield to the contractor, the pumping contractor. And mostly we can work with this rule of thumb that when we have this step test, we can use the driller's yield to give us how much um, water we need. So the step one would be one third of the estimated driller's yield. Step two would be two thirds of the estimated driller's yield. Step three would be the driller's yield. And step four would be four thirds of the estimated driller's yield. So this is the basic rule of thumb. Sometimes we'll see that it's way too much and the, the graph will go down very fast. The water level will go down very fast. And sometimes we'll see that it'll go down a little bit and just even out. So maybe it's not enough. So we wanna make sure to kind of see how the response is as we're um, supervising because the supervisor needs to be at the step test, the whole step test. During the pumping test, they need to be there for the step test and also be there to um, give the constant rate to the, the pumping um, contractor as well. Uh, another thing that we wanna make sure, which is an issue that has happened multiple, multiple times, is that sometimes when we say that our minimum yield is one liter per second, a contractor will say, okay, if your minimum yield is one liter per second, perfect, I've got a pump for you. And at the end of the day, if they don't, if we don't talk about what the actual driller's yield was for that borehole, we could be picking a pump that is way too small to actually fully exploit what the borehole can offer. So we wanna make sure that the contractor has a pump capable of giving 1.5 times the driller's yield. So if your driller's yield was one, then we wanna have a pump that can provide 1.5 liters per second. But if your borehole can provide three um, liters per second, so we wanna have a, borehole, a pump that can provide three liters, three, um, 4.5 liters per second. You wanna have at least 50% more in order to make sure that that pump can produce that much water at that certain depth. And we give a little bit more because usually here we say it would be 1.33 um, times the amount of water in the pumping rate, but really we wanna have 1.5 because also it's important to remember that these pumps are not as efficient as they were when they were young little pumps. Like pumps for pumping tests are always breaking down. And we wanna give ourselves a little bit of um, security and like room to, to make sure that we do the step test correctly and maximize the amount. Um, I wanna go over this graph a little bit so you guys know what we're talking about. The blue is the, um, the discharge. So this is the rate that we're discussing. So here you can see that it's 0 0.8 um, and then it goes to 1.7 and then 2.7 and then 3.5, 3.6. So these are the rates, these are the steps. And you can see here, the red is the water level. So it comes down from the top and it's kind of how you can think about where the water level is. At the beginning, it's at its standing water level. In, during the first step, it dips down and it kind of evens out a little bit. The second step, again, it dips down even further, but again, evens out. And you can see that in the third and fourth step, the borehole, the the line doesn't really even out. It continues to dip down just a little bit um, shallower angle. So in this way, we want to see that like we don't, we can't pump at step four. We couldn't pump at step three, but somewhere in between step one and two is where we're going to do our constant rate because we know over a long period of time that this slope will even out. And when the slope evens out, we call that the pseudo steady state. And the pseudo steady state is what we're really looking for. That is a sustainable pumping rate that we can use for a long period of time in that borehole. So once we've done this, um, we go to the second step. We've decided what our constant rate is by looking at this graph or also by looking at the raw data, seeing where the, the water drawdown evens out. And then from there, we choose what the constant rate is. Now the constant rate can be from 12 to 24 hours. It depends on what country you're in. Um, and it's based on the step test. So the hydrogeologist again should be deciding what the constant rate should be in um, also with the contractor. And 
we want to make sure that they're carrying out the constant rate for the amount of time that's um, given in the VOQ. And very, very important is once the constant rate is over, we're also measuring that recovery rate for um, at least two hours or up to 95% of the standing water level. So when we do the constant rate test, you see that the board, the, we have again, this blue line is the rate and you can see that it's the same the whole time, 3.6. And then you can see that the, the drawdown on the borehole dips down pretty quickly in the first um, hour and a half or so, and then sort of evens out a bit. Now you can see that there, we haven't really reached a straight line, a pseudo steady state that is absolutely straight. So we would probably choose for this borehole to go a little bit lower than 3.6 liters per second. And also here, here is where we have the drawdown um, in meters. And we want to make sure to write down this depth right here because that's the dynamic water level. That is the maximum amount or the maximum drawdown where the water is the lowest in the borehole. And we have to keep that in mind because we need it for the design later on. And we need to make sure to also take that into account when we talk about where we wanna install the pump. Um, again, from the contractor, we always wanna be in, in uh, communication with the contractor, but the main things that we need from the contractor after this pumping test is the pumping test reports, all of the measurements, and they need to be provided in PDF and also in an Excel format. So we can also do our own analysis. The contractor should be doing an analysis as well, but we have found over time that the contractors are kind of doing an eyeball analysis. So it's not very um, specific and oftentimes they don't even put it on a graph. And if you don't put a step test um, measurement on a graph and you just look at it by eye, you can get close maybe, but there are so many characteristics that you can't catch. Here you would just see that the, the number is about the same the whole way, but you can't see that it never really hits a pseudo steady state and we don't know what that slope actually is. So it's important to know what the slope is and also it's important to know what the slope of the recovery is because you can see here that the recovery goes straight back up. Um, so this is really important too because when we have, um, we have the constant rate and the water level goes down and down and down and you have the recovery, if it takes a long time to recover, that means we have to choose a lower rate because we're pulling water very slowly from the rest of the areas around it. But if we have a super fast recovery rate, that means there's a lot of water waiting around to come back in, but maybe it's coming through smaller cracks. So this kind of gives us an idea of what the extent of the aquifer is and how much water there is around. Um, so here's a little bit of an explanation about how to do the pumping test. So the responsibilities of the IA supervisor are to make sure to have a phone call with the contractor beforehand. Again, this is an issue that we've come across a lot um, where not necessarily by the fault of the IA supervisor, but oftentimes the contractors aren't prepared. So the only thing that we can do to make sure they're prepared is to call them and to bug them and say, okay, so we have a pumping test in a couple of days. Do you have a pump that can provide 2.5 liters per second? Yes or no? Have you tested out the pump for pumping 2.5 liters per second? Here is the design. And this is where we need to install the pump. Um, and also we want to make sure that we have more than enough of all of this, this supply that they have plenty of piping um, and that they also have a working water level meter and a second working water level meter. But again, we are bringing water level meters. So you guys will have that tool as well, just in case um, you guys get to a pumping test and suddenly the, the water level meter isn't working. Um, again, it's also something that has happened to me as well. Um, so again, we are getting to uh, the pumping test. We, we make sure that we have a water level meter. This is what we saw before. This is how it looks on the um, on site. And then also we have, uh, we know how high the, the, what the ground level is from the top of this casing where we're taking the measurements because here is where the measurements are usually going to be taken. Again, this is something that we've added to the new form because sometimes it can be uh, an issue between the measurements and where the ground level is and, and what that difference is. Um, here we have the pump itself. Again, we need to make sure they have enough piping to install the pump in the correct area. Um, 
And then uh, we can also have in here later on, we will have our own divers that will go on a separate tube as well. And the diver will take the same measurements that we take with the water level meter, and it will just be a backup. So um, hopefully that all that stuff will get ready and we'll have it to you when we meet in Tanzania. Um, again, so it's important for the supervisor to make sure that the con pumping contractor, oftentimes this contractor is not the same contractor, it's a subcontractor. They need to know what our standards are, what our expectations are, um, and they need to make sure to, um, we need to make sure to bring the diver, our own water level meter and a flow meter as well. Um, and we need to make sure that they're recording the yield at each step and the constant rate. And we, you have to be there for the four steps of the step test and for determining the constant rate. Um, so here are some basic rules for the pump installation. Like I said before, we were talking about how we cannot install the pump in slotted um, casings. So when we are doing the, the pumping test and also when we are installing, basically choosing a pump for a project, we need to make sure that the pump is the correct pumping capacity, that we're installing the pump in plain casing and not slotted casing, because we don't wanna be pulling in any of those sand particles from the gravel pack. Um, we need to make sure to install the pump at least three meters above the borehole. Again, for the same reason, we don't wanna be pumping any um, sediment into the borehole. And uh, we wanna make sure that the dynamic water level is gonna be at least two meters above the, the borehole. So during the, the pump pumping test, if we have a yield that's too high and we see that the water level is going down too quickly, we would lower the rate and make sure that also no water, no air got pumped into the, uh, into the pump as well. So there are two main threats that we have that come into our pump. If the pump is pumping sediment that could mess up um, the interworkings of the pump. But also if the pump is pumping air, it could mess up the, the pump as well. So we wanna make sure that we're protecting the pump because it's one of the most um, expensive parts of these uh, boreholes. And then we also wanna make sure that the, um, the pump is at least five meters below. Um, the, in, the, in the future, when you're installing in the project, it's at least five meters below the dynamic water level. Okay, so the last part of um, the pumping test is the water sampling. So after we do the pumping test, we need to make sure that we're going to be doing um, the water sampling of the borehole. It needs to be at the end of the pumping test. That's the most ideal time. If it's impossible to do that because of the laboratory, we need to then um, do the pumping test and come back and also pump the borehole uh, with an alternative pump with a different contractor or with our own pump before we take the water sample. So the most important thing here is that we're taking an initial water sample before any disinfection occurs. Um, so we take the, the water samples and we of the raw borehole water after it's been drilled from each borehole and it has to be contested to see if it's suitable for human consumption. So the first thing that the IA supervisor does, I know that in some countries, we have a government representative or a contractor doing the sampling. And in some places we also do have our own sampling. So it's important to make sure that we are collecting and labeling all the samples according to the IA standards and procedures. And if you're on site when it's happening and you're not the one who's transporting it to the lab, it's your, idea, your responsibility to keep your eyes on those samples and to make sure that they're done correctly. Again, if you have a contractor doing it or you're doing it, you need to make sure that the samples are stored in a, a cooler with ice and they need to be kept at a low temperature. And the samples, especially the microbiological samples, must arrive at an approved laboratory within six hours. And then we need to make sure that the lab that someone is following up with the laboratory. So if it's not you delivering the sample, then it should be you talking to the contractor about um, when the sample arrived at the laboratory and maybe talking with the laboratory representative as well. And then after that, after we've finished doing all of the water sampling, we need to make sure to get all of the results from the laboratory and fill out. We've chosen a few um, specific parameters to fill out the parameters themselves on the Google, on the um, IA app. So then we can start building our own database of how the water quality changes with the region, and that can give us a better idea of where our perspectives need to go in the future. So it's really important that we're filling out these forms um, to make sure that we know what the quality of our water is in every single borehole, every single time we test. 
So um, I wanted to go over a little bit about what the, uh, the causes of borehole contamination can be. Um, the groundwater quality can be influenced by two main sources. The first one is anthropogenic, which means by people. Um, the main things that we have are agriculture, which could lead to very high nitrates or nitrites. This is um, when people are trying to make their plants grow faster, they use nitrates, which feeds the plants and makes them healthy, healthy but can also um, cause, can also feed um, unhealthy bacteria. Uh, also livestock as well can cause the same types of bacteria and nitrates. Um, mining can cause really high acidity and toxic heavy metals. Um, and then if you're around industry, there can be oil or chemicals. These are all things that are bad for our health, as well as if we are near sewage or wastewater areas, you can have E. coli and coliforms as well as viruses. Um, and then when you have over pumping, um, this can cause a higher amount of salinity in the water as well. So if you're really over pumping the aquifer, this can cause um, you can have aquifers that are saline in the first place because they kind of dissolve whatever's in the rocks around them. But if you are over pumping, you're leaving less water for minerals to dissolve into and it could cause um, higher salinity in general. For the geological causes that we have, um, this is whatever contaminations, contaminants are coming from the rocks themselves. Um, when water flows underground, it absolves minerals, it pulls minerals from the rocks around it. And then um, the water can come back uh, with dissolved minerals in it that can be fluoride and arsenic. We know that those are both very dangerous, um, as well as radioactive substances. And you can have hardness, which is actually the amount of um, calcium and other calcium and magnesium that are in the water, which causes uh, the, it causes stains to form as well as um, little pieces, like deposits of, of sediment on the outside. It's like white. It's usually you can see it in your um, in your kum kum um, in your kettle. Uh, when you heat up a kettle, it will come out um, as white flakes, um, and that's hardness. And then we can also have toxic metals that can dissolve into the the water as well. So these are some some issues that we have when we have bad water quality coming back. Um, sometimes it's from people, and sometimes it's from geology. So. Uh, when it comes to people, we can avoid that by really doing a good hydrogeological survey around figuring out what is around in that area. And when it's geological, we don't really have control over it, but we can kind of control where we are, um, where we are moving and where we are having new projects. Uh, and that kind of gives us uh, a sense that we need to make sure to record all of these areas. We need to make sure we know where the hot spots are, where we have bad um, uh, water quality, and that can help give us power moving forward to create um, or to find better water, cleaner water for, for our um, communities. So for water sampling, um, just a little recap about how to do the water sampling. If, if you're the person in the field doing the sampling or if you're supervising a contractor doing it, we need to make sure that we have all of these things in order to carry out a sampling that will not be contaminated by the sampler. So the first one is not on here, we're gonna wash our hands and then put on gloves. Uh, alcohol or a lighter are used to, um, to disinfect the tap itself. If you have a plastic tap or a PVC pipe, you wanna make sure that there's no bacteria around the pipe itself. You wipe it off with um, an alcohol swab. And if you have a metal tap, um, if you're sampling water at a tap, tap stand, you're gonna be using a lighter to flame the tap and that kills all the bacteria around it. It's um, a faster way to, to do it. Both are used and some are used for different types of taps. Alcohol can also be used on metal taps, but if you're gonna have, be able to do it, the lighter is better for metal taps. You wanna have sample containers that are the right size for the sort of um, water sampling that you're gonna do. So usually the microbiological is smaller, the physiochemical is larger because they do more tests on it. Then you have um, a permanent marker and the labels. You want to make sure that the labels that you put on the, the containers have all the pieces of information you need, the village, the project, the borehole, who was the sampler, um, and what type of uh, sampling is being done. And then for the um, transportation, 
once you take the sample, you want to put it into a cooler and ice box, and you want to take it directly to the lab and make sure at the lab, they're also putting it in a refrigerator. So you don't want to have any more microbiological um, issues. For physiochemical, there's a little bit more time, but again, if you're already taking the microbiological, move them both at the same time and make sure that the samples are all there within the, the time range. Um, here goes a little bit into doing the, the containers and labeling. Again, we have a few different examples of what we have. This is a Whirlpack bag, um, and then two examples of different samples that we have. Here you can see that these little jars are for the microbiological. The big ones are for um, physiochemical. You need to have the village and community name, the borehole identification number, which is also going to be a new part of the form. So you'll be able to get the borehole identification number off of the form, the IA standard borehole identification number. Um, and then you can have uh, a number that's issued by the municipality, local or national government. So there's two identification numbers. There's the IA identification number and then the government identification number. And we do this because we need to have a record of every borehole that's drilled versus the bore, only the boreholes that are viable that have water. That's who we um, register our boreholes with, with the government. So that's the difference between the two. Um, and then we want to have a source description if the water is from the tap, if the water is from the borehole, or if it's from the tanks. Um, and then we have a date and time of collection, and then the name and initials of the person collecting the sample, uh, as well as um, at this point, it's also can be good to identify if it's for monitoring purposes or if it's the initial water sampling. Um, here we have the steps of water sampling. The first is that you need to wash your hands. Then you put on latex, latex non-talcum gloves. The talcum is a mineral that can show up in the physiochemical sample. And we need to remember too, that all of the, um, the equipment that moves from borehole to borehole, if you're doing, or not from, from sample point to sample point, sometimes you can move from, do a couple of different boreholes in one day, or you can sample a tap and a tank and the borehole water. Everything must be changed between because we need to make sure that we're not cross-contaminating if the borehole water is clean and the tap water is dirty, or if the borehole water is dirty and the tap water is somehow clean because we have treatment. So we wanna make sure that we're keeping these samples completely separate. So the, your gloves must be changed. And also you need to make sure that whatever pump is going to the borehole is also disinfected as well. Um, you wanna disinfect the HDPE pipe or the tap, depending on what, where you're sampling with alcohol. Then you want to rinse the container twice. You fill up the container and rinse it with water twice just to make sure that there's nothing on the bottle and you're only getting sample water. Uh, then you fill the sample to overflowing. You squeeze it a little bit and then put the top on and that creates um, a lack of air in the bottle as well. Screw on the cap and seal the container. You want to have, if you have extra tape, you want to um, put PVC electrical tape around the cap to make sure it doesn't leak. And then you want to dry the container surface put on the label and then label it with all the things you need and then put the samples in a cooler box with ice and make sure that these samples stay out of the light. Um, sorry, also at this point, we can do uh, some of our own sampling in the, once we do the water samples, we also have our field samples that we can do as well. Uh, we had a presentation on it recently and we have the video for it. And we can do our own sampling to make sure that when we're in the field, if we wanna just get an idea, we can sample at this time using those strips or using the EC meter. Um, and you can find out what the pH is, what the, um, if there are high nitrates, if there's high iron, and that can give us an initial 30 second um, response to whether or not we have uh, problems with that borehole water. Um, and then also we can do our own field microbiological samples, but they take about 24 hours to to get the answers for, but again, that can still be much faster than taking it to a lab. And if the lab um, is not reliable, that can also be another alternative to, um, to sampling when we're doing monitoring specifically. So the next step when we're specifically in the borehole um, uh, sampling process, we do the pumping test. In the last hour of the pumping test, we take the sample. And then the, the last step of this is we do the borehole shock dosing procedure. So we wanna do this because a lot of times when you drill a borehole, you can have um, uh, contaminations come into the borehole from the surface while you're drilling. Um, and the way that we do this is we want to 
calculate the amount of disinfectant that needs to be used by figuring out how much water is sitting in the borehole itself. Um, then we add the, the disinfectant into the borehole here. We figure out whether or not it's liquid or chlorine bleach. We figure out what the volume is of liquid bleach or the weight of um, chlorine bleach. We add the disinfectant, we mix it around. We then pour the mixture into the borehole and we pump. Um, we have a pump inside the borehole and we pump the borehole just enough so we can smell chlorine coming out of the outlet. That means that the chlorine is mixed from the top of the borehole here. You can see my mouse and it's come all the way down into the bottom of the borehole. So basically the pump just ensures mixing. Then we stop the pump and we wait 24 hours. After we've waited 24 hours, all the bacteria that's in the borehole should be completely out of the borehole. Um, and then we wanna pump again and we wanna make sure we pump until there's no chlorine left in the borehole. At that point in time, the borehole has been disinfected and we want to, um, we will wait and see until the, the next time or until we get into commissioning. Um, we double check again to make sure that there is no microbiological contamination in the borehole. Um, again, when we want to find out that there's no chlorine left in the borehole, we don't have to take it to a lab. We just need to use a chlorine test strip and make sure that there's no smell of chlorine and that there, the chlorine level is below 0 0.5 ppm per meter or 0 .2, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 is really what we do for drinking water. But again, as uh, we pump water out of a borehole, the chlorine dissipates very quickly. Um, so. Here is a little breakdown of the, the flow chart of how the drilling portion of the projects go. We started with a prospective site visit. Um, hopefully we have a hydrogeologist that's um, with our, our field engineers, um, or sorry, with our field officers during this prospective site visit. And they're kind of like looking around as well, seeing if there's a lot of contamination threats in the area, seeing what the differences in elevation are. This is very important in order to figure out if the, the site is um, conducive to having a project. Then we say, okay, we wanna work with this site. Um, we send off the, the project to a contractor. We send contracts, do BOQs, and then they have their surveyor um, do the desk study and the hydrogeological, um, hydrological and the geophysical surveys. They find, um, three good drilling points. They do multi, they do a survey that has up to at least six drilling points. They find um, good drilling point identification. And then from there, we go into drilling. We drill at the first priority. When we're drilling, we're doing all those different types of logging and we're making sure um, that we know where the water strikes are um, and that we know what the penetration rate is and all these things. We're taking all this data, combining it together. And we're also asking at the end of the day, does it meet the one liter per second minimum from the driller's yield? If it's a no, then we will most likely re-drill, especially if it's a very low, if it's much lower than that. If it's a no, we'll re-drill. And if it's yes, we'll design for the design the borehole for installation with all of those logs we took, um, specifically the lithological log and the, the water strike log. Um, and then after that, we design. We uh, then have the design. We get the design from the contractor or we help the contractor create a design, approve the design, and then make sure to supervise installation. This is a really, really crucial step and our supervisors must be there at that point because it is the only time in which we have eyes about what is happening in that borehole, how it was installed, if it was easy to install or if the, the casing got stuck on either side, did they install enough casing? Did they install the plain casing in the right spot? Did they have a bottom cap? was the slotted casing um, installed in the right spot. Because if you come back after installation, all you can see is a hole in the ground. You cannot really tell how the installation went down, if it was difficult or if it was not difficult, if there's a threat to that borehole um, moving forward. It's really important for our supervisors to be there. Um, the next thing we do is we um, are present for the development. We wanna make sure that the development happens for at least one hour um, and until the water clears. Sometimes the development, the water will clear very quickly. Um, so even if it clears in 20 minutes, you wanna make sure development goes on to a full hour. Um, and if it doesn't clear quickly, continue to develop until the water clears. If it doesn't clear at all, that's an indication that there is a problem with the casing and you can um, talk to us and we can help uh, consult with how we can solve the problem. 
After the development finishes and the water has cleared, we wanna let the borehole rest for 24 hours. And then after that, we can proceed to the pumping test. Like we talked about before, we have the pumping test and we do the step test and the constant rate test. And we also measure the recovery, which gives us how much. Well, the step test gives us how much water we can pump. The constant rate is for how long. And the recovery kind of gives us an idea of how big of an area we can pull water from. Um, and then at the last hour of the pumping test, we do the sampling. We need to make sure that the samples get to the laboratory very quickly. And the sampling is done cleanly and, and um, basically with all, all the things we need. And after we do the sampling correctly and we get the, the samples to the lab, we also want to do the borehole disinfection to make sure anything that was introduced in the borehole during drilling, any sort of contamination, bacterial contamination is killed. We want to see if the water analysis is okay. If the water, the initial water analysis that we did here, remember it's before the disinfection, if it's good, we say yes, we proceed to construction. And then we end up doing another um, water sample right before and make sure that everything is still fine, that nothing else has um, come into the borehole. If the water analysis is not okay, we're going to go to the next chart that we talked about before. And we do um, the sampling flow chart where, again, starts over, we have the sample in the last part of the, the pumping test. We take the sample and we do the borehole disinfection. From this sample, the water analysis um, is taken to the laboratory. And then you have the physiochemical and the microbiological results. If the physiochemical results are within the limits, we proceed with construction. If the physiochemical analysis exceeds limits, if we have really high EC, which means really high salinity, if it's very salty water, um, like very, very salty water, or if we have really high nitrates or really high fluorides, very high heavy metals, you want to consult with the, the IA water quality department and we'll try to figure out if there's another option, if we need to redrill or if there's some sort of treatment that we can do in order to, to minimize this. <clears throat> For the microbiological analysis, we have the E. coli and coliform. If E. coli and coliform are negative, that's a good thing and we're going to proceed with construction anyway. Again, if we have within limits and E. coli coliform negative, proceed with construction. Um, if the E. coli and coliform are positive, we're still going to proceed with construction because E. coli and coliform is not a stumbling, it's a stumbling block, but it's not something that says that we cannot have a project. We just need to do um, disinfection treatment on the borehole. So um, we, if we have E. coli coliform positive, remember we did the disinfection up here. So we had this first sample of disinfection. Now let's see if the disinfection actually worked. We resample and do a microbiological analysis. And if we see that there's still E. coli and coliform, we're gonna say, okay, this is a sign for us. We're gonna do the, um, the, uh, the treatment and we're gonna treat for E. coli and coliform. And again, all of this, we're gonna proceed with construction. So the only thing that can really stop us from proceeding with construction on a borehole is if it's below one, milli one liter per second. Um, yield or if we have a really poor physiochemical analysis. And those are the reasons why we would have to either redrill or consider different types of treatment for any borehole. Um, so looking into the future, the, those were all the things that we're currently doing right now. The, the great ability that we have and the amount of projects that we're working on can give us so much um, knowledge but it also gives us a responsibility to make sure that the boreholes that we're drilling are sustainable and that there's reliable water sources for our communities. Um, so that really brings up the, the purpose and importance of monitoring our water quality and also the water level in the borehole. So the way that we do this is by water quality, we're gonna make sure that the water is still um, meeting the drinking standards. And we also want to make sure that we're avoiding overpumping. We do this by doing monitoring, water quality monitoring um, over time. We can do it in the field. We can also do it by laboratories uh, and hopefully going into the future, especially now that we have the water quality forms on the, on the app, we can start really taking the water quality data and looking at it um, over the geographical area that can give us a bigger picture of where the water quality is good, where the water quality is bad, how can we improve it? Um, and then the other thing that we can monitor is the water quality, or sorry, the groundwater levels. And the groundwater levels, you can see here, oh, this is, sorry, this is actually conductivity. 
groundwater levels are important because if we pump over a long period of time of a couple of years and we start seeing that the water level is going down, that's an indication to us that the aquifer might not be as healthy as it was before. So we can fix that by doing a little bit like a little bit lower pumping or changing the way that we're producing. Or if we see that the groundwater level is the same, we know that we're in the clear and that we're in a sustainable pumping um, situation and we can continue to go on as normal. But it's really important that we take this time to do the monitoring as, um, as we go over the years to make sure that our projects have long lives um, and make sure to help as many people as possible. So that's kind of where we're going with this as well this year. And we're really looking forward to, um, to, to doing more work with you guys. So the steps forward after all of the hydrogeology portion is finished in one project, the things that we need to bring to the water engineers are the um, borehole location where we have a successful borehole. We also wanna send them the borehole design uh, as well as a pumping test analysis and results. And also we wanna recommend a pump installation depth so they can create the design. And again, with that, we need the static water level and the dynamic water level, as well as the recommended pumping yield. So these are all the pieces of information that we have um, compiled and put together. We give this information to the water engineers and they create the design and we pass off and go into the next step of the process. Um, and so this concludes our portion of the, of the PowerPoint. And I think Gil has been um, responding to you guys on the chats and we wanna open it up for uh, questions. There's actually a couple of questions here that uh, I thought we could discuss Should we together. leave the PowerPoint open? Um, yeah. But let's take a moment just to give a round of applause to Emily and Gil. Excellent presentation. Yay. Excellent job, excellent job, really, both of you. Uh, and yes, let's just proceed uh, answering some of the questions. Okay, so we have one question here from Keith. Um, on average, our solar pumps operate for seven to eight hours a day, and therefore, wouldn't a, an eight hour constant pumping test be enough? Um, okay, so um, as far as this goes, we don't wanna, when we're talking about a long-term project, a project that we expect to last 30 years, we don't know exactly how that aquifer will be affected over a long period of time. If we pump seven or eight hours a day, or what do you say, seven to eight hours per day total. So if you do a pumping test that is only eight hours, that means that you're only getting the response from one day. But it, we're planning on pumping these projects for many, many days in a row. So the way that we can best do this is by having a longer constant rate test, which gives us more of an idea of the area, the amount of aquifer that we're really pulling from. So the longer, the better, really. Um, 24 hours is uh, should be is better. And even in Israel, what we do with um, boreholes that they're working with is they'll pump for months and years even before they even start providing water just to make sure that that water is sustainable. So we are smaller projects, but it's very important to do a, as long of a constant rate test as you can in order to understand that that water um, yield is really sustainable over the long term. So that's why we do a longer constant rate test. Also, why would we be using solar pumps? Would we be using generator for uh, it's, that's regular. Oh. All right, so uh, Boniface has a, um, wrote another good question. Controlling the flow rate um, is important for a successful pumping test, that's true, but it is sometimes difficult to get the calculated constant flow rate when adjusting. So what is the acceptable buffer or tolerance um, for the different variations during the pumping test? Um, <clears throat> I would say that the, you want to make sure that the that you know what the yield is. We want to have, I guess you could go like one or two off um, or like point, 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 one or point 0.1 or point 0.2 off, but you have to know exactly what it is. So the way that we do this during pumping tests is to always, even while you're doing the pumping test and you're waiting around, you want to double check what the yield is by um, going to that outlet and making sure that the pumping rate is staying the same. As long as we know exactly what the pumping rate is, it doesn't have to be exactly what you decided it was. It can be a little bit off on either side. You just need to know what that number is. So the 
precision is more important than the accuracy, right? The, yeah. Like you need to know exactly what the rate is. It's okay to be a little bit off as long as you know what the rate is. And that's and, and done me, by measuring. Emily, remind us again, how do you know what the uh, borrowed yield is? How do we measure it? We measure it by taking a bucket of known volume. Um, you go to the outlet and you say you have a, a bucket that is 10 liters, right? So it's a regular size bucket you use to clean your house with. Um, you take a stopwatch, you hold that bucket at the outlet and you say, okay, so this is 10 liters. <clears throat> you start the, the timer, you fill up the bucket and you see how long it takes you to fill up the bucket. So if you have, if it takes 10 seconds to fill up the 10 liter bucket, you know you have one liter per second, right? Or if it takes five seconds, you have two liters per second. So that's how we calculate what the, the pumping rate is. And I know that it can be hard because there are um, oftentimes when you're doing this, the only way that you have to, to change the pumping rate is to by opening or closing a faucet, just like you would um, in a bathroom or at a, at a sink. By opening the faucet, you are giving a certain pump rate. If you close the faucet, then the amount of water that comes out is a lot smaller. So as you close it, you need to measure it and you need to have someone, you need to have two people to help do this calibration. Obviously the contractor is doing this all the time. So you can usually ask, ask them to do it um, or supervise while you're doing it. They can close the, the valve a little bit, then you can measure if it needs to be a little bit different, you close the valve a little bit and measure. And then once you're there, you mark where, where the, that valve was when you started and you can stop the pump for a second and then the valve is open. You can turn off the generator, stop the pump, allow the water to come back up and then turn on the generator again, turn on the pump and the valve should be at the correct spot. So you just need to be continuously measuring. And, and Emily, just to make sure that we all understand the pump that we're using for the pumping test is not the same pump but that we will be installing uh, inside our borehole. No, the it's a pump. pump. Two it's different a pumps. Different pump. Yeah, the pump that's brought by the pumping contractor is meant for um, use with generators and not with solar panels. So that's the main difference that we have. And also that pump needs to have a higher capacity than the pumps that we'll be using for our projects. Okay, um, since we still have time, let's take two more questions. We have a question by Rogers. Uh, what will happen with the low yielding boreholes? For instance, if a borehole yields 0 0.6 liters per second, do we backfill it? What is the protocol? So this is a little bit uh, more dynamic. Um, so we normally depend, it depends on how many um, more drillings that we have to, to do. Uh, if we have more drillings and we have a water guarantee, then we would backfill it. Um, if we're working with a contractor that doesn't work with a water guarantee, then we would have to consider that again and decide whether or not we needed to combine two boreholes. Um, but normally when we have a water guarantee, we would backfill uh, because we have more options. Um, but again, that doesn't mean that it's a hard and fast rule because we know that in some areas they're very water um, stricken and they don't have really yields that are even higher that, than that at all. So we would have to consider what the design would be um, and, moving forward. And correct me if I'm mistaken. Even if we were to drill another borehole to check its yield, uh, we would preferably wait until we've drilled that one uh, before backfilling the first yeah. one in case we did want to combine. It depends on the, how far away you are from either. And also oftentimes if you have a borehole that's drilled in hard rock, you can leave the borehole and it won't collapse or anything. So you could have them leave the borehole and then try to do another attempt and kind of see um, what you you have to do. Uh, but it's not, there is no one answer. Just to simplify, maybe we should say that the minimum requirement is one liter per second. That's what we want. We want to provide in every one of our projects a minimum of 3,600 liters per hour, one liter per second. That's what we want. But if we drill once, or twice, three times, four times, five times, and the maximum yield that we get is 0 0.5, then we're gonna have to make a decision. What should we do? Should we leave the village? Or should we maybe combine the two boreholes? And therefore we need to install two pumps 
and combine and together we will get the minimum requirement that we want with it one liter per second. So here again, when this uh, comes, when this is the situation, oftentimes uh, bring it to my attention and together we can make a decision whether or not we should continue or leave the project. Or maybe just have a hand pump. If it's a small project, a small village or a small school, maybe we can use it as a hand pump. Mm -hmm. So those are uh, special cases that uh, oftentimes uh, I, I am involved and together we're making those kind of decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Jonan asked if there is a situation where the IA pump has already been installed and the project is complete, is it okay to just lift the pump slightly and inject and pour chlorine solution into the borehole rather than completely uninstalling the pump to disinfect and install again with the pump um, with the pump out of the water? So. Um, Ideally, we have a contractor who's doing this, and the, the main issue that we have here is if we're putting a really high amount of chlorine into a borehole, it can cause corrosion in the pump. So uh, it's okay to have to pump the, the borehole just a bit to make sure that the chlorine comes out, um, but leaving that borehole, leaving the pump in the borehole with that high of a chlorine concentration is not great for the pump. It probably won't affect it um, in the long term, but it, we'd like to avoid it. So it's more ideal to take the pump out um, and then do the disinfection. And then as the 24 hours go on, chlorine is very unstable in water. So it will break down um, during the 24 hours. And then you'll have a much lower chlorine concentration when you pump that water out. So it's not a matter, and especially like if you have more water coming into the borehole, the chlorine concentration will go down and down. And so it's the safest thing to do is to take out the pump itself. Um, and then uh, wait 24 hours. Okay, one last question uh, from Dio. If silt gradually collects with time, uh, I guess at the bottom of the borehole, can it reach the slotted casing and affect the borehole recharge? This is an excellent question. Okay, so this is specifically the reason why we wanna make sure we have plain casing at the bottom of the borehole. If we have a water strike at the bottom of the borehole, and the slotted the silt comes down into the borehole and starts collecting there, that means that that, borehole, that slotted casing and that water strike becomes blocked and we can't use it anymore and it's not part of our yield. So it's really important that we hit a water, if we hit a water strike at the bottom of the borehole, we make sure to keep drilling and make sure that we have at least three meters of plain casing at the bottom of the borehole with no water strikes around it. So we can make sure that that slotted casing lets in as much water as possible and that no silt can end up um, filling up the, the casing itself and blocking the slotted casing. I think that's it. Okay. Um, anyway, thank you all so much for listening. Yes. Remember not to have slotted casing at the bottom of the borehole. Sivan is correct. All uh, right. Okay. Emily, Gil, excellent job. Will you all agree? Thank you. Excellent. Okay, we are on time, actually 15 minutes early. So uh, I think we should take a break. Yes. Uh, maybe we should go for lunch. So go ahead, enjoy lunch. Uh, we should be back in 45 minutes.